Welcome everybody and I'm going to hand over to Andreas now and he's going to do his presentation. All right, well thank you very much for your time uh, for you who are attending. Uh, today I'll be talking about validation and verification practices and I think that's an important topic as far as HACCP, cleaning everything from shelf life and so on is uh, concerned as well and I think it's something that uh, People are still confused sometimes around uh, what those specific terms mean and how you best uh, uh, conduct those sort of activities as well. So before I go uh, through the specific presentation, um, my name is Andreas Kleber. I'm one of the uh, principals of Quality Associates. Just to start again, my name is Andreas Kleber. I'm one of the partners in Quality Associates. I look after our training organization as well. And my role as a technical manager has taken me around the world from Marks and Spencers to Coles and also working at various universities here in Australia. And my focus is really to help the industry achieve great products for consumers and also to have confidence in systems, either as a manufacturer or in retail as well. We work quite closely with a large range of different food businesses, everything from retailers to uh, engineering companies, regulators, packaging, but also FMCG companies, meat, dairy, baking, seafood, and so on as well. Our services range from consulting and helping people establish good HACCP systems, good TASIP and VASIP, so that's the food defense and food fraud type systems as well. And if we're looking at HACCP in particular, validation and verification are very important acti activities within that as well. But we also work with specifications and labeling. So again, our verification are important aspects within that. Product testing is often a verification activity, but can also be done as a validation activity to make sure that processes are safe. Uh, customer complaints, they then highlight that there might be issues that need to be looked at and recalls that we also work as sponsors within. You often see that something has not gone quite right, either in the verification or validation. Our audits and inspections highlight often where issues sit in that space as well. And obviously today we're talking about training and validation and verification. And so what we'll do today is we'll actually cover the uh, key elements within those. Uh, we've got a more extensive course if you're interested in more information, but we're going to go through validation and verification in some detail in the webinar today as well. And as you can see from the slides, Validation and verification can happen in the lab, it can happen online, it can happen in a manufacturing environment or a quality kitchen. So there are lots of different places where people need to know what validation and verification actually means. In a nutshell, what validation and verification really is looking at is that you have a trusted system. Without validation and verification, you can't trust that the processes will work as intended. Without verification, you don't know whether they actually have worked as they were supposed to be. And calibration is something that I'll split out as well, uh, because again, it comes back to trust and our system's going to measure and give you real data that you can actually rely on. So let's start with the definitions. And so I went to a number of different uh, dictionaries and what you find in the dictionary often is a little bit confusing. It says validation is making sure that something is true. Verification is an action that establishes the truth of something. So if we're just looking at those definitions, that doesn't really help us to distinguish between the two. But if you're looking at HACCP and other systems, it becomes really quite clear what validation and verification actually mean. Validation, you're planning for food safety to succeed. So you're basically setting yourself up for success. You're looking into the future and whether the systems that you're establishing are going to process a safe food. Verification is the opposite. You're basically checking that your food safety plan has actually worked. So you're looking to the past and you're making sure that what you had established as food safety systems have actually worked and verification can also be used to look at whether there are new hazards uh, that you might have to consider. And therefore, that then might lead to other uh, rounds of validation as well. So validation 
looking in the future, planning to succeed, verification, looking at the past and checking that things have operated as they were meant to be. And if we're looking at HACCP and we look at the five preliminary steps, there is verification built into that. If you're looking at step five, the on-site confirmation of the flow diagram, that is a verification activity. If you're looking at the seven principles, principle three, establishing critical limits, that's all about validation. It's basically based on what do you believe that the critical limit is going to be appropriate, that it's going to produce a safe food. And if you're looking then at uh, principle four, establishing monitoring system, and principle six, verification, both of those are verification steps. You're looking to see what happened and whether what happened was as intended, or did something break down, it didn't function properly, and therefore you then need to go into corrective actions. So validation is all about whether things will actually work. So when we look at critical limits in particular and how to validate those, the easiest way to do that is to start looking at the regulators and to say, what does the food standards code say? What does Appendix 3 limits for food processing say um, as far as what is safe and what is not? And so here I've got some examples of those limits. So storage temperatures at five degrees Celsius or less uh, is, has, has to be maintained if food is susceptible to pathogenic growth. That's just one of those limits and that's something that we can use for validation. Similar to cooling rates, 60 to 21 degrees in two hours, 21 to less than five in four hours. That's a food standard code requirement unless you validate something else is sufficient. And so, for example, in the meat industry, they've set out their own processes, the, the cooling rates that they feel are appropriate, but that has to be validated. You can't just come up with numbers at the top of your head and assume that that's going to work. So that means you have to look at the process, what that means for microbial growth, if you achieve cooling rates that are different to what's set in the food standards code. The limits for canning of low acid foods, pH less or equal to 4.5, and that's all about managing Clostridium botulinum. The stereo cooks of 10 degrees for two minutes, that's part of those limits uh, that you can look up as well. Water activity for staph aureus, less than 0.85 for dry goods. So they're already pre-established, validated limits that you can refer back to. If you don't have anything like that, or you can't access studies that actually tell you, or models that tell you how uh, the critical limits need to be established, you need to do that work yourself. But validation goes beyond just the critical limits. Shelf life validation is a very important one. And that's often where we look at the quality and food safety and those sort of things and setting shelf life, but often they're static. And we don't look at transport trials to see whether the pavlova that looks great in the factory is actually going to last through shipment. Is vibration going to destroy it, like the one in the image on the right? Is temperatures are going to be a problem for things like chocolate if it gets too warm and the quality is lost? So those sort of things come out of transport trials and they're an important part of shelf life validation. If you have products that are going to lose weight, during shelf life, you need to look at weight loss validation. How do you ensure with overpack that the product at the end of life is still meeting the labeled weight requirements? Now you can look at accelerated shelf life testing for some quality aspects, but from a microbial point of view, that's going to be difficult because as soon as you accelerate shelf life testing by using higher temperatures, you're going to select different organisms that are going to grow and cause spoilage, for example. So it may not be appropriate for everything. And if you're validating shelf life, you have to validate the secondary shelf life. If you're producing goods that are going onto a retail deli and they're going to be unwrapped, you need to establish what that secondary shelf life is going to be. Now the next part, the microbial challenge testing, is probably one of the most misunderstood types of testing that's being done in Australia. 
And that's because often people doing shelf life testing do some pathogen testing and take the absence of pathogens as that the product is safe. But if you had no pathogens there in the first place, uh, testing for pathogens at the end doesn't tell you anything about whether the process was making the product safe or not. And so for microbial challenge testing, you have to inoculate with the pathogen or a substitute. And the problem with that is that that's not necessarily a cheap exercise and it has to be done under controlled conditions. But normally you would inoculate with say 100 to 1000 per gram of whatever the pathogen is uh, into the product and then see whether it uh, dies off or whether it can grow. And you have to obviously then go through the process and establish whether those processes are making the food safe or not. Validation can also be done for equipment validation. For example, if you have a uh, baking oven, uh, you might want to establish where the hot spots and the cold spots are and what that does to your overall uh, cooking process. And cleaning validation. If you get new equipment, how do you make sure that it's properly cleanable? Uh, what do you do to make sure that the uh, procedures that you've written actually create clean and sanitized equipment. So validation comes into that space as well. So assuming we've done all the right things as far as validation is concerned, uh, we then need to go and have a look at verification. Has our system actually worked? And so in verification, there are lots of things to look at. And if we come back to HACCP and uh, principle six, which is basically verification. We need to ensure that the processes were in control, that the HACCP program was implemented as intended. So that means you have to look at some records and see what actually happened. You have to make sure the HACCP plan is up to date. Does it incorporate all the latest developments? Because if it doesn't, you're going to get caught out with hazards that you haven't considered. Are the prerequisite programs actually functioning effectively? So you're cleaning and sanitizing and pest control, all those sort of prerequisite programs. If they don't function properly, you're not processing in a safe environment, and therefore it's unlikely that your HACCP system will actually uh, work. And you have to look at your facilities and equipment, whether they remain suitable. So are the floors intact? Are they still cleanable? Are the drains cleanable? All those sort of things. But when you're looking at verification, you also have to have a schedule, and if you look at a, a HACCP audit table, you then see these key aspects that I've listed here as well. So when you're verifying, it is who is going to do the monitoring, what is actually going to be monitored, where are you going to do that, when, which is basically how often, and how. So without that, you don't really know what you're looking for, and you can't risk assess whether for example, the frequency is often enough, uh, for example, for sanitizers. If they drop off when uh, something changes, you have a higher biological load, you might need to uh, look at the levels of sanitizers more frequently. So there are all the sort of aspects that you need to predefine as far as setting up your verification process is concerned. And there are lots of different activities that come under verification. As I said, cleaning and sanitizing is crucial. But verifying labels, making sure that they're appropriate, that the right label was stuck onto the right product, that your suppliers were approved. So you basically know what their risk management is. Looking at your PIFs, so what is the information that you have on your raw materials? And if you don't update them every year, chances are eventually you're going to get caught out with some changes that didn't make themselves onto the label. Testing is clearly a verification activity. It's not foolproof in the such that you can't test everything. It only gives you an indication of whether your systems are working at a high level. But it's still an important activity from a verification point of view. CMP audits, internal audits, they all part of verification as well as our traceability exercises, mass balance exercises, and those coming together under mock recall. Because at the end of the day, without proper verification that systems are working well, chances are sooner or later you're going to end up with a food recall. And that's going to be terribly expensive 
It's going to have a major impact on your company, on your job. And so you need to make sure that those sort of things don't go wrong and therefore you don't end up with a fruit recall. So having a look at calibration then, it all comes down to can you actually trust the equipment that you're working with? And that's obviously key if you're relying on those measurements to say whether a critical control point is under control, for example. So the requirements for calibration, some of them are legal requirements, for example, for trade measurements, uh, but you need to also have a look at uh, your environment where you have heat and vibration, you have cleaning chemicals, and all those, those sort of things are going to impact on the equipment that you're going to use for measurements. So you can get errors, you can get drift in equipment as well. So you have to be able to trust the reading. And when you're setting up your critical limits, you have to allow for the tolerances that those equipment uh, have. For example, if your tolerance on a thermometer is plus minus 0.1 degrees, you therefore have to set up your target temperature at least 0.1 degrees below 5 degrees, if that's a critical limit. Because otherwise, if you set it at 5, the true reading could be 5.1 or 4.9, and 5.1 would be in breach of your critical limit. So you need to adjust for the uh, tolerances within the equipment that you're using. So the whole range of measurement equipment that you need to calibrate, obviously temperature, weight, but bricks, pH can be quite critical, firmness measurements, it's a whole range of uh, equipment that you need to actually calibrate. The metal detector is probably one of the most critical pieces of equipment for many uh, manufacturers. That's often a CCP, so you need to make sure that that is actually working effectively. So calibration comes into that with test pieces that are known so that you actually know whether the machine is working properly. And you have to consider not just internal calibration. For some things, you have to set up external calibration, whether it's, say, for scales, where you at least have to have an annual uh, calibration that's done externally for trade measurement scales. So you need to be uh, mindful of that when you set those calibration schedules up. The other thing to consider with calibration, it actually has to cover the whole range of measurements. There's no point calibrating a scale for 200 grams if you're going to pack 500 grams because the, lin the linearity of the response isn't really given. And so you have to have a test weight that actually is higher than the actual weight that you're packing. So um, the other thing I would just uh, like to say also is the calibration units. They're expensive, and a lot of people in a wet environment uh, may not treat them as well as they need to be. And so uh, test pieces that are in toolboxes that are rusted and pitted and uh, stained and so on aren't going to do the job. So you have to manage those uh, with care as well. So in summary, today we've covered a lot about validation, verification, and calibration. They're all part of trusted systems uh, that you need to manage to be able to trust uh, what is actually going on as far as your food safety system is concerned. As I mentioned, we also have a slightly longer course where we go into more detail of those activities as well. Uh, but just finishing off today, uh, basically, if you have any questions, and if you do, we also have a blog where you can get further information uh, on other topics as well, such as food fraud, for example. So I'll hand back to uh, Fiona now, and uh, we'll see if you have any questions. Andreas, looks like you've done an excellent job covering the subject, and no one's got any questions. So um, we'll we'll finish off now. Just to let everyone know that the recording will be up on our website probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, and if you are not a member and you've registered, um, you'll get an email link with uh, with access to the presentation. So, um, yeah, thanks, everybody, and thank you again, Andreas, and um, have a good day. Thank you for attending. Thanks.